Hey everybody, my next guest has one of the most horrific stories from one of the most horrific places on the planet, and that's North Korea. She escaped North Korea, she was sold into the Chinese sex trade, escaped that, then came to America. Now, she's spreading the word on what it's like living in communism and showing us the signs that we need to be aware of in case it winds up on our doorstep. So pay attention. Please like, subscribe, comment below. Head over to Apple Podcasts and Spotify, leave us a review. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Yonmi Park to The Sean Ryan Show. Yonmi Park, welcome to the Sean Ryan Show. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> it is an honor to have you here. I've oh. spent a lot of time listening to a lot of your different interviews, and man, you have so many phenomenal interviews. I think the one that sticks out the most with for me is uh, Megan Kelly's. I listened to oh, Megan Kelly's recently, yes, and you're okay, and. Um, Man, you guys had a, a very good in-depth conversation, and um, I can't wait to have that conversation here. So yeah. just a little bit about you. Um, you fled the most oppressive, isolated, controlled country in the, t in the entire world in 2007, that country being North Korea. You've offered two books, In Order to Live, and the latest one, While Time Remains, which While Time Remains seems like it's maybe a warning to the Americans on what might be coming. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now you bring awareness and educate people uh, all over the world about the oppression that happens in North Korea in your journey to the United States. And you're also a YouTuber who yeah. just hit 1 million subscribers. Congratulations. Thank you. I know that's no easy task. And, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so every guest starts out with a gift. So, oh, wow. here you go. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, gummy bears. A little something for the ride home. Oh, thank you. I love those. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> but um, your story, there's just, there's so many different parts to it um, mm -hmm. from your upbringing and how you grew up in North Korea. It sounds like you grew up in a wealthy family in North Korea, which I can't wait to dive into yeah. what a wealthy family looks like right. compared to here in the U.S. But I'd kind of like to start with your upbringing and obviously talk about the oppression and how the regime in North Korea controls the people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would really like to get in detail uh, in the trafficking portion mm -hmm. and what you dealt with in China. Um, and then kind of wrap it up with, with the similarities that you see here in the United States. Maybe they're starting to happen, or maybe they've been happening for a while, mm -hmm. um, compared to some of the stuff that you uh, saw in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let's just start with your upbringing. What, what is a wealthy family in North Korea? What is daily life for a, a wealthy family? Yeah, <laughs> it's a, how do we begin? So even though North Korea started in the idea of complete equality of outcomes, right? Nobody will be poor, nobody will be uh, rich, but regime 
based on that idea, initially and eventually divided people into 51 different classes. And a lot of times we kind of <laughs> assume, like are we in the middle or in the bottom or in the top? But I was maybe born in the some, like somewhere upper middle class. Okay. Because my father was a party member. But the thing is there are like six million party members in North Korea and in the population of 21, 22 million at the time. So it wasn't the most like special thing, but still like better than other people. And this is where I think, <coughs> sorry, I don't know. Um, so lifestyle, right? It's a, I never seen a shower in my life. Wow. Because we don't even have the word for a shower. We don't have a technology to heat up the water. We don't have running water. So we still had to go in the river, bring the oil in the well or you know, stream water home. And we don't have indoor bathroom. We have to go outside to do the business. We don't have you know, a <coughs> machine to wash the clothes. So it was my job to go to the river and my sister to wash our clothes. And, but you know, the fact that we are not dying from starvation in the 90s, that means wealthy. Because that means wealthy. Yeah, though all the actual poor ones died in the 90s. It was... Wow. So what, so what is the... Let's go back to the 51 classes. Yeah. How are those 51 classes broken up? Is it poor to rich or is it, is it, is it race? How, what is it? So North Korea is a homogeneous country. We are like same genetics, same people, same culture, same language. There's not no diversity in that. The no only tribes, no different no. areas. Everybody's just Korean. North. Okay. Yeah, we were the same Korea with the South Korea. We had a five thousand years of shared history. Same country as the same country. So that's mm -hmm. unique. Uh, th what was based upon uh, from that division was, I think, something similar to right now, America is what your ancestors did, that their royalty towards the party's ideology. Okay. So it's not about individual's choice. You cannot join another class. Uh, basically, when Kim Il-sung came into power in the middle 40s and the 1950s, that's when he came and then realized, okay, who was a landowner? Who was a capitalist? Who was an intellectual? You know, who was a a farmer, and based on their status, their children's status get determined forever. And that's how they say when I was born in the country, my great-great-grandfather handled some land in his yard, and they said I had the oppressor genes, and my blood was tainted because of his actions. Wow. So that's how your status get determined. So in a way that America, we divide people based on race, in North Korea, they do that based on the, I think, ideology, what okay. people back then believed in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your so your grandpa owned land. Did they just take the land from him? Yeah. So that was my mother's side. Okay. And my father's side was better. So that's why my father was becoming a party, became a party member. And my mother's side, I think they weren't. Wow. Yeah. How do they How do they confiscate? Do you know how they compensate the land? Do you remember or were you too young or? So it was just stories we hear, right? It's a, in the fifties, they had a land reform. And that was when the regime was promising to North Korean people that we are going to abolish poverty and inequality in any forms. We are going to be all equally doing well. Everything is going to be taken care of by the government everything will be free. Healthcare is going to be free. Housing is going to be free. The food is going to be free. Everything is going to be free. Nobody can ever trade anything, but nobody can ever own anything. They abolished private property. So nobody can own a home. They can own a cow. They can own a car. They can own a house. They can own anything. So, but the thing is, at the time, North Koreans actually believed that that was a Paradise, social paradise, right? Is we are equally doing all well. So for that little, people gave everything to the regime at the time, and there was not much of battle between the people giving that to the regime, and the people, some people who did not uh, disagree, they get executed, obviously. 
their oh. three generations get executed along with the people who rebel against the. I parts. read this. I saw mm-hmm. this in a. So I, also in my research, I watched some documentaries on North Korea. That way, some of your story was still surprising to me. So, one of the things that I saw was that if you go against the state, or if you commit a crime, or if you vote the wrong way,、mm. then you'll be imprisoned. What I、yeah. what I then what came was that there are the three generation punishment. So, if I、yeah. voted against the state, I would go to prison. My son would go to prison. And if he had a son or a daughter, then they would be born in prison and spend the, li- the rest of their life in、yeah. prison because their blood is guilty blood.、Right. Is that is that is that across the board over there? No that, matter what the crime is, or is there a severity? Or yeah, so you know, right, there's no way you can vote wrong way because North Korea election only has one person on the ballot, and it's a open like. Guards standing there watching you, and there's only one choice on the ballot. So it's you cannot run like you cannot vote for a different person. Okay. It's a joke, right? It's like、yeah. or like sure, it's a show. But if you start something against a party, like okay, I don't believe in communism, then you of course get killed. You get executed, obviously for that. But then your parents, your sisters, brothers, your children, your grandchildren. And up to sometimes eight generations. Eight generations. Yeah. So even the in-laws gets arrested. So your wife's, their family, the in-laws get go together with you. Just for disagreeing with the with the with the state. Yeah. So、uh, one person that I know in South Korea, he was born. I mean, he went to Pergam prison camp when he was eight years old. And the very first thing when you arrest and go to political prison camp is that you cannot ask why you're there. You cannot ask why you're there. Then that you that's you get executed. So nobody knows why they end up in the prison. And then for him, he learned many years later that his grandfather, a、uh, long time before one day, he was drink getting drinks with his friend. And then under the alcohol influence, he somehow showed a disagreement with the party's line. But later, that friend remembered that saying and then reported the police. That's why he sat during while they were getting a drink. So he ended up in prison camp, but he could not ask the regime why did I get here. So most people don't know why they ended up in the prison camp. Is there any way to get out of it? No. You're in there for life. There's yeah, some, there's one、prison. sentence, and that's a life sentence. And most of them don't last more than three months. Usually, you die from the exhaustion and torture. So, oh man. Because they North Korean regime needs these people. They do a lot of chemical tests on them because they are developing bio weapons, and then they doing so much nuclear tests. They need to have people need the people to clean those debris. Oh. So they need this labor. So they use the they use the prison, prison labor.、Camps. Yeah. So they're doing so they're torturing. They're doing experiments, and they're using them to clean up nuclear、Debris. waste, which is、Death. huge exposure to radiation, which will obviously kill you. Yeah. What kind of experiments are they? Are they? Many different experiments. A like even during the Nazi Germany, they test on different gas. Uh, they test on different like injections because they develop a lot of poisons. Because that they commit a lot of、uh, assassin attempts, right? They killed their brother in、mm-hmm. Malaysia with those poisons. So they test on different poison, how it kills or not, and they even just cut off their organs and like body tissues to check, you know, how to study some medicine so they can make the dictator, the leader, live forever. So there's more than ten thousand doctors in dedicated North Korea to find a way to make Kim live forever. So in this study, they need a lot of in- inmates. Oh my god! So、gosh. they they take them and play with their organs and see what helps to make the dictator live forever. He wants to live forever. Yeah. So that's the that's the big experiment. Yeah, huge. It's called like Mansumugang Yonggu. So it's like the eternal life. 
uh, research institute that has like 10,000 doctors. Just all day long they are studying that, how they can make the dictator live forever. What do the doctors, what do the doctors think about the dictator? You cannot think about it. In North Korea, if, even if you are a doctor, you don't get paid a $1 salary each month. You're a slave. You don't choose to become a doctor. They tell you to become a doctor. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's no way you can have an opinion for anything there. What, so, so back to the prison camps, they have a three-month life expectancy. On average, yeah. If they're going to, let's say you get a, a sentence where they're going to execute you and you, you, you don't even know what you're being executed right. for. Right, yeah. How long are you, is it like America where you're on death row or do they just get it done immediately? It uh, depends when they want to make a case out of you, like uh, want to create a fear to the people. So when Kim Jong-un killed his own uncle, Zhang song tak remember when he came into power and then he one day arrested his uncle publicly. Basically what he did was a, he made sure all the officials in Pyongyang come and put him in the center and then you use an aircraft gun to shoot him, not just guns. So when you shoot somebody like that, you become literally like pieces of meat. Your body just gets exploded. And then he would let the dogs to eat his body. And the officials would like faint and pee in their pants. And that's how he touched them. This is what happens if you do not be royal to, you, to me. So some executions are just throwing stones. So they put their family members, put them in the first row and then like throw the rock at your family, your wife, your child. So the last thing you see living this world is seeing your child, your husband throwing rock at you and to kill you. Oh man. They, so they make sure the families denounce the person first. Wow. Are these public executions? These are uh, I never seen the throwing the rock, but I heard that's what they did in, inside the concentration camp. So they inside the concentration camp, they make sure the son and mother like they stand in the front row and do that, and the other people should throw the rock because Kim Jong Il at the time said that even the bullets are too precious to kill these people, so you should just use rocks to kill them. Wow. Yeah, and then but shooting is usually the public execution that general public goes to watch. Okay. Does the general public enjoy this? No, it's mandatory. It's mandatory. Children need to go watch it. Like, even you're two years old. If you are, when you go see the public execution, the sitting is based upon how young you are. As in, if you're the youngest, you sit in the front row because you're the shortest. So adults go to back row. But those adults have seen this when they're kids. So they put the children in the front and then bigger children the behind and the adults in the back. And then they see people getting executed. How often does this happen? It's there's some seasonal, it's like uh, several times a year, I'm sure minimum, but sometimes like very often because those are times where they say showcase time, where they, it's like tightening the bear like really trying to raise the field level as much as they can. So those times are constantly shooting and then sometimes like off and then we think, okay, we need to do this again and come and shoot more. How many executions per session? It's sometimes, uh, sometimes one, sometimes three, sometimes eight, depending on the case. Okay. So sometimes like the cases were like these people were Hung. So one of the executions my mom saw was a this young man in a collective farm who was dying from TB, tuberculosis, tubercul right? Tuberculosis. And then he uh, butchered the collective farm's cow. And then he ate the cow because he was dying from the malnutrition anyway. So they were executing him in the marketplace, just him. And one of the executions I saw was a my friend, actually mother, she distributed a Hollywood movie. So she watched the Hollywood movie and then gave it to her friends. And in North Korea, that's a crime. You cannot watch Hollywood movies. You cannot watch a Hollywood, that's an executable offense. If you ever read a Bible, that's execution. You, if you ever watch a porn, that's execution. If you ever watched a Hollywood movie and distributed, that's execution. And 
I mean, <laughs> the executions are like this. There's a every front page of North Korean paper has a Kim's portraits, and then you didn't see the page. It's a backwards. You ripped it. That's how you go to political prison camp. Wow. Those are the crimes that we talk about in North Korea as a crime. Even if you, I saw, even if you fold a paper and you fold, yeah, you fold the photo yeah. of. You cannot, you cannot put other things on top of it either. You oh need to, gosh. you need to pretend this photo is the actual the leader, right? And every home in North Korea, we have the portraits of dictators. So when the, if the fire caught in the house, the father's first thing they have to protect is the portraits, not their children, not their for wife. Because if the portrait gets damaged, then the three generation is going to be punished in that family. So there are so many heroes that we learn, like who somebody was like died with his own body protecting the portrait. And that is the most honorable death you can do in North Korea. Like dying for the leader is the honorable death. They teach you to do that. Speaking of religion, since we're on the, on the topic of um, the concentration camps, what, you can go to prison for your religion there as well, correct? Mm -hmm. So they round up Christians. Yeah. Is Christianity, is that a common underground religion there? You don't know if it's the most persecuted like, religion in the world. I mean, in, in North Korea at least. So I did not even know, like, know the word Jesus or like, I did not know what that was until I got out. Are you religious now? I am now. You are. But in I think I later met other fellow North Korean defectors who were Christians, who were in the underground. So what was really uh, surprising to me because none of these people can own a Bible, right? So if there are two people in a team, then they say, okay, you remember Psalms, you remember this part of Bible, and his grandma taught him all the entire one part of Bible to him verbally, so that knowledge wouldn't get lost. Because that is the only way you can maintain the Bible in North Korea. So he was reciting entire thing word by word. And I was like, how is that possible? Like, this is my grandma told me. So I, that's how Christians are believing their faith, by just memorizing, because there's no way you can have the Bible, basically. And if you get caught? Death. It's a death penalty. Yeah. Is every death, if you get caught doing anything, is it automatically three generations that are going to be punished? It's a political crime. So my father's crime was economic crime because he was selling metals. He was trading. He was not committing anything political. He was not saying the party is bad, right? He was not doing anything like that. So that's why I didn't go to prison with my father. Okay. He was only sentenced by himself for like 10 years, but still my now caste went lower. I could not marry somebody who was in a better class. I could not imagine going to university. Like, I couldn't do that. But uh, political crimes, then your family do go with you for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Man, that is horrible. What about, let's talk about some of the child labor that's happening over there. Mm -hmm. What age are kids... Are kids forced to work? Any age. Like as even two, three, four, uh, even pre preschool, that they they teach you that you are revolutionaries, you are not child. So when we go to school that we pack our work clothes with us. <laughs> so I was even five years old. We pack our work clothes. And then we go to school, we learn about, okay, we need to do 500 hours of each dictator about their, how great they are, the pro propaganda, right? How amazing the leaders are, how great our party is. And those lessons are in the morning. And then lunchtime, they don't feed you, of course. If, if the family couldn't afford to make you a bento box, then the child gonna just not eating lunch that day. And then that lunch period is over, then that's when you have to work. So they say, depending on the season, they send you a collective farm to plant the seed in the spring. The summertime, uh, we don't have machines. Like if it's in the farm, there is like a lot of other plants grow 
that takes the crop away, right? So we have to ourselves take those like other plants away. And then in the fall, we need to help the farmers to do harvest. That's what we need to do. And then in the winter, we need to help the farmers collect feces as a fertilizer. So entire winter time, my job was looking for like literally poop everywhere because mm-hmm. we have a quota to submit. Otherwise, we get punished. I read that the 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 food shortage, the starvation that's happening over there, it's so bad mm-hmm. that it, that they are now using now they're using human feces to fertilize the soil for. But it was always that way. That's it was why, always that way. That's why North Koreans always have tons of a like worms inside them. So one of the defector soldier was crossing the NZ. And then the South Korean doctors opened him up. I mean, they could not believe, like, meters. You can see on CNN, meters of meters of worms in North Korean people's body. It's very common. I mean, I had tons of worms there because the food grows from this. So that's our children's job and adult job. What are you eating over there? We eat... Depends, right? Like, uh, in the summertime, we do eat more plants. But the thing is, after June 1st, like end of May, a lot of plants become poisonous. So until then, poison level is not as high. So we can pretty much eat any plants if we want. Even tree leaves are fine. But after June 1st, you have to be a lot careful what mushroom that we pick up, you know, what plants we eat. Uh, We eat a lot of, in the fall, we eat a lot of grasshoppers and a lot of bugs. And then... In the winter is the time when we a lot of eat frozen, you know, potatoes or a dried cabbage like that. And spring is where we die. We call spring is a season of death. It is. Because right before the, anything grows in nature and winter time, all our stock's gone. And it's hard to find even any one single rat to eat in the spring. Does any? It sounds like all of the food comes from what you grow or what you catch. You're talking about eating, eating insects. Mm-hmm. Does the state provide any food? Right, you cannot grow them because we cannot own a land. The f- land is a country's right. The regimes is a collective farm, so we are forced to work in a collective farm all year, like two, like ten hours a day minimum. Then when the harvest comes, what they do? They come and take the, all the harvest away. They don't give it to the farmers. They give you maybe a little bit of like potatoes. And then they, what they do is like, oh, this is a royalty grain. So you need to submit this grain to the government to show your royalty, otherwise you get punished. So <laughs> this is thing called the royalty grain that we always have to give it to the regime, despite we don't have anything. And the regime determines that they decided somehow it's easy to do socialism when there are less people. And it's easy to control the population when they are starving. Mm-hmm. Because as a North Korean, all that you are thinking about is how I'm going to find the next meal. If you make one day, you're, gonna, you're not knowing if you're going to make it tomorrow. right? So you're constantly just thinking about only finding food and surviving. Then regime knows that they don't need to worry about us. Because we are not going to think about starting revolution. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Moving into, we'll get back to the ways mm-hmm. of life, um, but moving into how they control the people, since mm-hmm. you brought it up, you know, starvation was number one on my list. I thought that was very obvious. I, I read that the population of North Korea is so malnourished that they have basically changed their genetic code and they are now five inches on average shorter than South Koreans. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that true? Yeah. It's like North Koreans, if now I come to America, like I cannot gain weight because just our systems didn't fully develop, right? When you need to eat the proper nutrients to, to develop and develop your organs to process things, we didn't get to do that. So... It's interesting in South Korea, like the grandchildren are much taller than their grandparents. North Korea is a complete opposite. Each generation we get shorter and shorter. Oh, wow. 
and it's a that's why you carry the mark of starvation for the rest of your life. It doesn't just like, oh, now you're not starving, you, you can become a normal person. It doesn't happen that way. Most of North Koreans carry that scar. Let's talk about, we talked about starvation. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the prison camps, the three generations. These are all ways to control the population and oppress them. Let's talk about the propaganda portion. Right. How many, what's your internet like? What is your TV stations like? Let's start with internet. We don't know what internet is. And we don't have electricity. So even I'm sure the internet, we cannot use it, right? Without electricity. We have one channel on TV. And even that channel is not free broadcasting. It's all government propaganda. But even if there's a one channel, we cannot watch you without electricity anyway. So there's no other information. People are not even free to move to next town. You cannot do a sleepover in North Korea. You need to go tell the authority and get authorization to sleep in your friend's house. In the middle of night, the regime, you know, guard, and just like open your door and come in, see if somebody outside your family is sleeping in there. If there is, then that's a crime. You get punished for that. No freedom of movement, no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion or anything. So we are completely isolated. That's what I was saying. When I was in North Korea, I did not know that I was oppressed. You know, I did not know I was living in a hermit kingdom. Because not knowing is actually true oppression. And I, I wrote about this in my new book. It's like there are two types of dictatorships. One is physical dictatorship. As I said, you know, physically you are not like a lot to wear jeans allowed to have a certain haircut or listen to music, watch TV. But second one is what North Korea and Nazi Germany did. It's like dictatorship of the mind. You con they control what you think. And I think that's what North Korea did such a perfect job than any other countries ever have ever done in, in human history. That they brainwashed me to the point where I thought that my dear leader could read my mind. I was afraid to think. I could not think that, in, even in my mind, that he was, make, he was not a god. And how they did that was that they copied the Bible. So they said, you know, God would Kim, Kim Il-sung loved us so much, he gave us his son Kim Jong-il. His body dies, but his spirit is with us forever. How, that's how he can read my thoughts, knows how much hair I on my head. And when we die, we join him in this paradise for the rest of our lives. So North Korea is one of the 10 religions in the world. It's a religious court. It's not just a normal dictatorship. Wow. And, and, and everybody believes that. That is another thing. In North Korea, you cannot do a public survey. You cannot go. Do you believe the propaganda? I mean, if you, nobody going to say that. So it's like living in North Korea is like living in a Truman Show. Mm -hmm. Nobody is telling you what's happening. The only truth you know is who you are. Because nobody even, I mean, the first thing my mom told me young, as a young girl was like, don't even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. They said, do, do not even trust your own back because we never knew who, who was a spy was. There was always spy listening somewhere. So it was just better not to even say anything and even better not to think that's how you survive North Korea. How do you control your thoughts? How do you keep, how do you keep the, the thoughts that you think you're going to be punished for out of your head? That's the interesting thing. Is like you think somehow humans are capable of thinking by themselves, but we don't learn how to think in North Korea. Like thinking was exhausting. I remember going to South Korea for the first time that I had to think for myself. Like even what I'm going to wear that day. It gave me so much headache because in North Korea, that was decided for me. What, what clothes I can wear, what haircut I can get, it was decided. So in North Korea, we don't know what critical thinking is. Nobody learned the concept that you can think other way. So in some sense, we are just all numb. I think I just remember being in North Korea, just being numb. It wasn't, it wasn't hard. I think for the first time thinking, was very exhausting for me, at least. Interesting. So in this, it's, 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 
I've been a lot of places throughout my career, and mm-hmm. I've never seen anything like what you're describing. And it's I th- if it's hard for me to understand, mm-hmm. I think it's extremely hard for anybody who's who's not well traveled or or, <laughs> or you know what I'm getting at. But just, so what you're describing is a country that's encompassed with. Everybody, nobody has any idea what is outside of that border. So they, I mean, there's no clues, there's no nothing, like, about how Americans live or how Europeans live or Canadians or in, or Australians or anywhere in the free world. There's no sign, like, people have no idea that that even exists. Right, so it's like a... Like in North Korea, for instance, I never knew the map. I did not see the map of the world. They did not even teach me that I'm Asian. They said that I'm Kim Il-sung race, my dear leader's race. The North Korean calendar begins when Kim Il-sung was born. We have our own time zone. And it's like, a, I keep saying that like I come from different planets. We actually know more about Mars <laughs> and the other planets. But we cannot even imagine what in the faraway galaxy land, there's some planet. We cannot even fathom what life would be like there. It's like because we don't know the name, we've never seen it, we never heard about it. Mm-hmm. Like for North Koreans, I mean, what is Tennessee? I mean, right? What's white? You know, what is a internet? It's a they don't have the vocabulary, they've never seen it. The only pictures that I saw about Americans were the school posters that propaganda department drew about Americans who are called the bloody reptiles who have horns, who are monsters eating our children and torturing our women. That is the only my image of American because I cannot go into and look up what American looks like. So in North Korea could do that because they completely isolated the country. I mean, you can go to, I think we might be able to go to the moon before we be able to go to North Korea. Nobody is allowed to go there and explore, right? Nobody in North can come out. It is the most isolated country in the world right now. So I think that's why they were able to do that. What kind of stuff do they display on the TV? TV is, uh, the good thing is the regime is very poor. They cannot make the new propaganda materials. So the same revolutionary TVs are under Japanese, under like American imperialism, how our great soldiers under the leadership of Kim Il-sung, that we are fighting our enemies and bringing the liberation to our people. That kind of things every day we watch, you know, and keep reminding it what an amazing thing that socialist revolution was. When there were times of greedy, greedy capitalist, they would like torture our children. Now look at us, uh, anybody who can't go to school. <laughs> Even though we, when you go to school, we get brainwashed and we get like forced labor, you know, forced to work. They still say that's better than living under the capitalists and landlords. Oh my gosh. What, um, when it comes to controlling the people, there's also, you kind of, you touched on it, where they control emotions. How do they control your emotions? You're not allowed to smile. You're not allowed to laugh. Mm. What else are you not allowed to do? It's, that was the thing I still like, try to understand. Um, whenever I, even my escape, even the beginning of my time when I came to America, even though in my head so fully logically understood that Kim Il-sung was a bad dictator, he was a merciless man who was killing people, but whenever there's a, this beautiful propaganda portrait of him in a gigantic smile where he's most beloved leader, the only thing he does is loving his people, and our Father, our God, right? Then just automatically your heart just warms up. But then the eulogy has kicked in afterwards. Like, oh my God, like, what am I even thinking? This is like all fake drawing, obviously. Isn't, he doesn't smile like that. It's a try to make you feel that way. And then whenever we see this portrait, there was always music. Somebody was just 
most dramatic way of, you know, saying how dear leader is so selfless being that all he does is trying to fight for the good of the people. And so it really happens first thing we do is like, so we need to say how to thank the dictator before we eat. We need to go buy in front of our portrait. Dear leader, thank you so much for the food, you know. And the school teachers say at school, the most important thing to you is not your parents, not your biological parents. It's your, our, our father, who is Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il. So at ch as a child, you learn, like, the first thing teacher teach you that that's the most important thing in the world. And, like, dying for the regime is the best thing you can ever do. And they keep showing these hero movies, how they give all their own body and take the bullets for the revolution of our country and then making us to recite those poems and the songs, like a, songs like Nothing to Envy, because we live in the social paradise, we have nothing to envy, right? Then eventually you somehow believe it, even though your real life is seeing people dead on the streets. You know, every day that's what you see in North Korea, but you still somehow have this pride and gratitude for the dictator. It is mind control to the fullest capacity. Yeah. What so, kind of, so just dead bodies, just It's everywhere. not just dead bodies. It's a, I mean, when people die from starvation, they go through many phases. They don't, you just don't die. It's just like, oh, I'm starving, I'm going to die, you know. There's a phase of hallucination. There's a phase of crazy. They just lost their mind. They started crazy laughing, you know, it's just, just like laugh. They don't recognize their sons, so they're not taking like their mothers. They just, like, just lost everything. And then the last face is a, everything opens up your body. Like your, just everything opens up. And your organs comes out because nothing can hold it together. And then just, you make this, Sounds that like some ghost would make, and but till that moment you still beg for food, and these are the sounds you hear every day. But when you live in the country, you don't feel anything for that because it's every day. You know, every corner there's children who does that, a father who does that, and your family who does that. So. This is like daily life, but at school we still have to sing songs like we have nothing to envy because we live in the best country. Oh man, you've seen a lot of that, haven't you? Yeah, it's a, it's just phase and you just all casually say, oh, now he's in the phase two. Okay, you are still far away, you're just still in the phase one. You know, like we, we seen the phase of a lot of death from starvation that I could just, just can't tell, and it's, it's not like we say it out of any sympathy. It's just, you become just numb, you know. Do you, did you ever reach any of those phases? I think for me, among all these things, there are a few things that I remember was about that young boy or man's, all the organs just come out of his back and the dog was just waiting for him to die and eat his organ, right? And all the flies all over him. But he was still making this noise. And I was wondering, how can he make any sounds? And the last person I remember seeing was right before my escape was a, in the hospital. There was like piles of human bodies and the hospital just like put them there. And there's a bathroom right next to it. I had to go through that to go to the bathroom every day. And there's on top of all these human bodies, there's a woman who was laying there in some flower pattern pants. But when you're dead, you're not a human. You just, you are just empty beyond anything, you know, just empty. But she looked way more empty because her eyes just out, her mouth was open because the rats ate her eyes first. And I was just looking at that, like, you know, it's like, what it means to be human, even human? It just means nothing. It, I think 
somehow that scene keep comes back to my dream. Maybe that's the last thing I saw in North Korea. Maybe that's why I cannot forget. But it's a, yeah, there's a lot of those. Say so the human life means nothing there. What's the family? I'll get to that in a minute. So as far as controlling the people, we have starvation, propaganda, punishment, which is the prisons, controlling emotions, mm -hmm. executions. Have we missed anything? Uh, Any strategies to control the people? As I said about making people criticize each other. So it's like a making people distrust each other, breaking the, tr the tr bond of trust between your family between your children. So first thing that they re the regime did, they got rid of the word love or romance, that we cannot live for love. We have to live for the revolutionary party. So the parents cannot tell their children that they love their children. We don't tell our parents that we love them. Spouses don't tell each other they love each other. It's not a concept. We don't have the word for a friend. I call my f classmate comrade. Comradeship and friendship is a very different thing. Because when you're a comrade, you fight for the revolution. You're not being a f two individual friends. Mm -hmm. And then even at nine years old, every Saturday, if you're an artist or somebody adult, you have to do it every two days. We have to come, entire class come together, and then we have to repent our sin for that week. Say, you know, I was not better revolutionary. I was being selfish. I was being individualistic. I did not fight better. And I will do better. Thank you, you know, dear leader, for forgiving me for my sin. And at the end, we have to do something called criticizing another person. This is a must. You cannot skip that part. So every classmates have to stand up and denounce somebody for their fault. Imagine you do that every week to human psychology. Mm -hmm. Then you have to watch out for everybody because you don't know who's going to criticize you at the end of Saturday. And if that criticism is bad, then your family get punished together with you. It's a life, life and death situation. So that makes sure that you're never going to trust anybody. And of course, you cannot start a revolution if you don't trust anybody. And then also, you completely isolate it. And it, that's how you watch out even, you know, mice and birds and afraid. Nobody knows who's going to watch you. And it happens with your parents. There are many cases that children will report on their parents. Really? Because um, the regime promises that's how you become a good revolutionary. But not only that, sometimes they tell children, I'm going to give you food. If you report on anybody who's betraying our party, I'm gonna give you food. So some children are so starving. They, they go tell the authority, like I heard my mom was saying this. And then the mom get executed. How many people do you think get executed a year there? It's, nobody knows because now that the North Korean regime knows that we can watch it from satellites and there's a lot of execution videos from satellite footage, so they do on inside the stadiums. So that's the height. But at least there are several hundred thousand of them in the concentration camps that the UN calculated based on those camp numbers and they can see even human body images now and bury sites. So these are all visible now with those satellites. What is a, what is something that you're talking about at, at, at school, they would force you to denounce a, a, a comrade. Mm -hmm. What is what is an example of something you would denounce somebody for, or criticize somebody for? It can be anything. You said you can be oh that person uh you know said that maybe the what you know the school material was not good or maybe like silly you know because there are so many propaganda materials mm -hmm. or. Oh, uh, he, I went to his house one day, I saw his parents were watching foreign TV, TV. Or I heard him one day that he was singing some foreign song. Or I saw him someday in a wrong outfit. Like, it can be anything. So is, is everybody punished? 
when if you denounce somebody, are they? Their family get punished along with that person. So everybody gets punished. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. So you have to be paranoid. You have to be. You have to be so paranoid. So what if somebody didn't see anything? Do you have to make something up? You have to see something. That's a thing. So that's why entire week you watch your behavior, but you have to find the fault in others because you are forced to denounce. And I mean, imagine if you just lied. I mean, that person gonna say it's a lie, right? So you have to find something all the time. Who does wrong? Have you been denounced? I have to be. I had to be. Everybody had to be denounced, and everybody had to be a. So things that I was denounced, it was like I was so little. So they give you quotas. Like if we work in the farm, we have to sit in, right? And they say in one hour, you have to finish this much. So if one person fails to, to finish their quota on time, the teachers would beat entire children in the class because it's something called the collective guilt. They teach you that you're not an individual. They, the first thing North Korea does to you is that you're not an individual. We don't have the word I. What matters is we, the collective. So if one person does wrong, it's not that person's fault, it's your fault, all of you. So that's how it's all about the collective guilt because you are not one single unit ever. And so I was, there were times that I couldn't finish the, all my quota on time. Then, of course, that was the subject of criticism. What was the punishment? Beating. Beating? And then uh, make us to run and crawl on our school ground as much as we can in intermediate night and give us extra work until like 2 a.m. in the morning. So a lot of beatings, a lot of punishing. How would they beat you? Anything, because there is no human rights. So teachers, some of them are even sometimes come like dr drunk. They get, they are so starving, right? So they have this anger. Then they are some psychopath, like literally bring these leather belts or like medals. And there's very common, they break your bones and take your eyesight away. Like they throw anything. They have this metal, uh, like where you put those cigarettes in. They can, yeah, asterisks, they can throw that at you, rocks at you. They can, they can kill you, and there's no accountability on anybody. So it's a, they do that children, like constant beating, everyday beating. And that's the thing, they think somehow you need to train your children and your wife through beating. That's the same. So Damn. if you don't train children and women, you have to beat them. When, what age does this start, the denouncing? As soon as around you're eight. Eight years old. Yeah. It starts around eight. And uh, beating starts as soon as one or two, even three months old. Because they never learn how to respect life. Yeah. So just throwing just literally a fin infant away. Like when North Korean women get, I mean, we are going to go back later, but they get raped in North Korea and back, they, they kill the baby. Right, so it's killing a baby is not a big deal there. It's not. No, killing a life is not doesn't mean anything in the society. Damn. Let's um, that's some heavy stuff. Let's take a quick break, <laughs> yeah. and uh, when we come back, let's talk about your journey on how you got out of there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by HVMN. You've heard the buzz about ketone supplements and how they can boost your workouts by helping your body use fatty acids for fuel. I take a shot of HVMN ketone supplement before my morning workout. It's focused energy. It's not an energy drink though. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. Ketone IQ comes in portable, convenient shots. They're great for cycling, long runs, and all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper on a regular basis. We also just received some exciting news. In addition to being available in select Equinox gyms, Ketone IQ can now be found in local Sprout stores nationwide. The taste may not be great, but it doesn't really matter. I wish I had this product when I was on active duty. Let's just say I think the product's pure. Again, it's not an energy drink, 
It's not full of a bunch of stimulants. You could get better endurance. You don't get the crash and it could help curb the appetite a little bit. Definitely a unique opportunity here in offering my audience 20% off your order of Ketone IQ. You can find Ketone IQ at hvmm.com. Use the promo code Sean at checkout to save 20%. Plus, if you subscribe, you can save even more. This stuff is great for daily use. Use the promo code Sean. Again, that's hvmn.com. Promo code Sean for 20% off Ketone IQ. Friends, it's hard to trust anything anymore. Our most important institutions are being systematically destroyed. Are you prepared for the worst? True freedom comes from self-reliance, and that means having emergency food on hand. Build your food foundation with a three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Each kit provides over 2,000 calories every day for strength and energy during tough times. Get breakfasts, lunches, dinners, drinks, and snacks. The food is delicious and the whole family's gonna love it. Order yours today and receive a free gravity-powered Alexa Pure Pro water filtration system valued at $279 as a bonus. With this offer, your food and water needs are covered in a crisis. Your three-month kit and free Alexa Pure Pro are all shipped to your doorstep in a discreet box with free shipping included. Don't put this off any longer. Tomorrow, it may be too late. To take advantage of this amazing offer, go to MyPatriotSupply.com. That's MyPatriotSupply.com. All right, Yomi, we're back from the break, and I'm really, I am very curious about how you got out of North Korea. I know you got trafficked into China. how did that happen? Yeah, it's a, so it's like escaping from North Korea is very different than how other um, immigrants escape. You know, we don't have a phone, we don't have a map, we don't have any idea. And the only clue I had about the outside world was seeing these lights like coming out of China at nighttime because I was living in the border town of North Korea. And that's my family and I had some clue that maybe they are better off over there. And if we go where the lights are, then we might find some bowl of rice. So you actually had no idea that it might be better there. You were just, you saw electricity. We just guessed it. And you thought, well, if they have electricity over there, then it must be better. Yeah. I saw on a documentary that one of the, the, the satellites, if you look at North Korea over satellite, it's a big black Mm-hmm. spot at nighttime yeah. where you see South Korea has energy, China has mm-hmm. energy, and then North Korea is just a black, it's just darkness because there a, is no electricity at night. Yeah, it's the darkest place in the world right now. So you you saw electricity on the other side of the river mm-hmm. and, and that's all you had to go off of. Yeah, just go. Let's go where the lights are. Let's go. Maybe if they, we go there, we can find something to eat. And I was 13 years old. I was something around 50 pounds, like very tiny, literally, you know, <laughs> about to die from starvation. And my sister escaped first, and she left me a note saying that, go find this lady. She will help you to escape. And I went to, to, to her, and she said, she could help me to go to China. And she said, once you go to China, you will find your sister and everything will be okay. But we didn't really ask follow-up questions. And also at the time, it really didn't matter. Because if we didn't escape, you're, not, you're going to die anyway. Mm-hmm. So there was no point of even asking, you know, why are you helping me for free? So was there any fear at all, knowing, you know, knowing now that the complete mind control, you had mentioned earlier that you were, thought that the state could actually read your mind. Yeah. That's how brainwashed you were. Mm -hmm. So was there any fear knowing that? Or was it, I'm going to die. So I'm either going to die here and I'll chance it there. So this is the thing about like you, people having a hard time to understand North Koreans, right? In some way, we are the most bizarrely innocent people because it, in North Korea, like, uh, we are never seen the bad news. 
our news is all about victorious battle that our army is doing and how our mother nation is thriving under the communism and everything is wonderful. There is no news about rape. I did not even know the word rape. There is no word like news about you know escaping or anything bad, right? So like, I was completely not understanding the bad things happening in the world. That if I were born here, I would understand. So just not knowing that how bad things can go wrong, that was not a concept for us. Because we just did not, I mean, even though we were seeing executions, those things was not on the news, right? So we just did not understand that selling another human being was a thing. It was not a concept for me, and we didn't even have the vocabulary for like human trafficking, or even freedom was there, right? So I think that was a thing, just we did not understand anything at the time. How fast did the situation develop? That morning, I found a lady, and she said I could go that night. It was that quick? Yeah, so the same day. So looking at 12 hours. And then my mother wanted to go home to tell my father that we are escaping. And that time, we didn't even know the word escaping. It was not, we were just like going somewhere to find sister. And we knew that it was dangerous to get caught, but I did not even know the word escape was there. We were like, okay, we cannot get caught because the guards are gonna shoot us if they see us. And I told my mom, we're gonna come back. I, I thought I saw oh, somehow going back there. I thought it was like temporarily we go to China, we find the sister, we find food and come back home. So I told my mom, like, if you tell him he's not gonna let us go, like you cannot tell him that. And my mom was like, then I cannot go, I cannot leave him alone. I was like, I just had a feeling if I left my mom there that she's gonna die from starvation. It's like, no, you have to come with me. So she so much trusts me, who's 13 years old, like younger. And she came with me. So we found, the, she introduced us to another guy who was going to actually take us through that journey of crossing the river, because that journey is very dangerous and she couldn't do it herself. And we had to climb a lot of different like paths of rocky mountains and then found a spot that was least seen by the people. And uh, I think they bribed the guard on that post of the guard. And okay. we crossed the river through there. Is the woman that helped you escape, is she North Korean? Yeah, she was North Korean. Do you have any idea how she made the connections to she, traffic people out? I heard that she initially sold her own daughters. And you would think it's a crazy thing to do as a mother. And if I were in North Korea, I would have done the same thing. Because that was the only way that I could would ensure my child not dying from starvation. Like she, I heard that she sold two of her, two of her daughters to China. And then at the time she was pregnant. And I think at this point she was, she rescued me. If she didn't sell me that day, I'd be dead. And she, I heard she got executed after we left and she got called and authority executed her for that. So, of course, the like, regime executes anybody, let them escape. Mm -hmm. But uh, she, that's how she got into the job, because she couldn't feed her children anymore. She had to find a way to make sure that her daughter lives. And that was the way she found that they, she had to send her daughter to China. How did, she make, how did she make the connections in China to sell her children? That I'm not sure quite. Sure, but uh, a lot of them now is impossible. But back then, the regime did not crack down on escaping as much. In the 90s, there's so many people dying from starvation. Even authorities could not track down who is dead, where. Like in North Korea, when we say goodbye to my mom when I was younger, like there's no guarantee I'm gonna see her again because there's no call, there's no letter you can write, there's no email. If she goes out, and she didn't find food that then died. That was it. Nobody, I will never ever see her again. So, so many people were lost like that, that regime just didn't care at the time. And Kim Jong-il thought 
He did not think the defectors gonna escape and go to South Korea and then speaking out and exposing the regime that way. So he was like, yeah, if they wanna go, let them go, that's fine. And then they realized by the early 2000s, oh, the defectors go and then become spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Then they expose what's happening in, uh, inside us. That's when they realized we need to crack down on the escaping. Okay. So that's why it became harder by 2003 and I escaped 2007. What, um, what, did they, what measures did they take to make it harder to escape? Each year was different. Like in the beginning, they would do, uh, build these fences and then they add a high electrified wire fence, right? Like political prison camps, there's electrified wire fences. Okay. And then they would give the shoot to kill order for the guards with the machine guns. Like if you see anybody, just shoot them. Don't like, like, you know, bother to catch them. And then they were asking China to help. China would install the facial recognition cameras with electrified wire fences again, everywhere the cameras and the Chinese guards on the other side. And then that was not enough, so they burying the landmines the entire through the border. And then they evacuate the citizens out of the older border towns inside now. So they are bringing key new measures. Now there's completely facial recognition cameras, landmines, electrified fences, both China, both uh, North Korea side, that it just became impossible to escape now. So it's, it's, it's damn near impossible to get out of there yeah, now. Yeah, now nobody can escape. Nobody can get out of North Korea right now. What does the border to South Korea look like? That's DMZ. That's mostly heavily militarized zone in the world. Okay. They buried, I mean, tons of landmines. I mean, there is any single thing going to cause a war between, I mean, the war never ended, right? If they are taking a break. So anything is a mini invasion. So that, unless you're the guard, that knows the path of invading the electrified wire fences and what time the electricity goes down, what time the post changing and where the landmines are. Unless you work there for like years, you would not know that path. So the one soldier who was the border guarder at DMZ and escaping, he got shot like something six times. So almost nobody can escape through that border. Damn. <clears throat> So back to you, back to your mm -hmm. story. So you're 13 years old, correct? Yeah. And you get sold mm -hmm. into... Sex slave. Sex slavery. Yeah. Is it only women that escape? Most of them are women because a, women are more in demand. They are men. Men are sold for as a forced labor. So they are like livestock. They let them sleep with their pigs and cows and horses in the bar and give them bare minimum food. And then they make them to do the most dangerous labor, like, you know, cutting the big wood, the, the mining and those kind of wood. And then they use the men's labor like that. But women's is more lucrative because they can sell us more higher price and a lot of organ harvesting. They buy us for our organs. China buys you for organ harvesting. Yeah. And they buy us as a prostitute. So they put us in a brothers, in a room. There's no rights. And they just put you in the room and get you raped. Like sometimes, I heard like 500 times. And they eventually, you eventually die after six months. You cannot take it anymore. And you die, then they buy a new girl and let her be raped and die. And some of them, like me, are being sold to another trafficker, and my mom was sold for a man in a farming town who was, like, mentally not stable. And they buy them as fake wives, as sex slaves. And if you are lucky, you get only raped by your supposedly husband, but a lot of times you're the cousins, fathers, father-in-laws, and the whole town men rape you around. Or the, the entire whole town? A whole town, they raise money and buy one girl and then rape around, and if she dies, they bring another girl. Or like an entire family, brothers, buy the girl and then share. Oh, it's just man. sex toy they buy. Wow, that is heavy. Um, how did you get trafficked? 
in in some sense, uh, they sold my mother first, and she they charge her for sixty five dollars. They, they your mother they sold price. your mother for sixty five dollars. Yeah, in the twenty first century, and I mean they were negotiating our like price right in front of us. Like they make us to turn around and check our bodies and. And they realized I was a virgin, so that was valuable because I was some perverted man love child virginity. So they sold me over like twenty dollars separate from my mom. And then uh, there's a human trafficker rings, right? Each trafficker makes more money on top of you, make the margins on you. So North Korean trafficker sold me, and this Chinese first trafficker selling me to the second trafficker. And that trafficker was a Han Chinese who bought me. His name is Hong Wei. He decided to kill me. He wanted me for himself, for his mistress. And these traffickers are like, in some sense, like kings, right? They have a lot of mistresses because they can afford it. I mean, if you can afford money to buy these girls, you can have it. like literally, theoretically, even 10,000 of them if you want to. So. He had a lot of mistress before me, and he <laughs> have sex with them, and he get bored, and he sell them to a guy, right? Like that was a thing. It's like okay, he buys a girl, he gets sick, then he sells her to another farmer or another brother, whoever give them the most money, and then he wanted to do that with me. So initially, he wanted to play with me and keep me as his mistress, and and he somehow thought was very very knew that by the time of this is, by the time the North Korean uh, trafficker, that guy, and Chinese trafficker, then by the time is a third line of trafficking. So a lot of them do not keep virginity. By then they are all get raped mm -hmm. and they do not keep that virginity. So he was amused. Like this is actually for the first time I got somebody who kept their virginity to this line. Like how did you do that? And Luckily, I was with my mom with a Chinese broker, and when he was trying to rape me, my mother offered her. And then after that, the guy trying to rape me, I, I felt like hell. I don't know what strength came out of me. I felt like hell, because I was ready to die. I was gonna kill myself if he raped me. And he thought, okay, if she kills herself, and literally she's crazy right now, then I cannot make any money out of her. So for him, okay, then I, I need to make money out of her. And this is the this is the third iteration. This is a, or the first iteration. This is a Chinese broker. Okay. Yeah. The fr so you went to so you were sold to one trafficker. So then from that North trafficker Korea sold to, you to the next. Yeah. He decided to keep you as a mistress. No, no. So there's a North Korean trafficker. There's okay. a woman, and then the guy who crossing the river for us. That's a North Korean too, and then from there the first trafficker Chinese, uh, Korean ethnic Chinese. And then he sold it to us to another broker with my mother at the time. And he sold my mom separately and he kept me to rape me. Okay. And there I was, I lost my mind. I was so fighting hard. And then he sold me to another trafficker. That was the third guy. That was Han Chinese. That's when uh, he, he decided to kill me. And then I was kill myself. I was gonna try to kill myself. And he said, if you become my mistress, I'm gonna help you to find your family. Because he was the one who sold my mother to a Chinese farmer. So he knew where my mom was. Like, this is one day, <laughs> it's a miracle. Like, he bought me, and then he showed me, like, uh, this thing called the phone. Like, I've never seen a cell phone in my life. And he was like, do you have ever seen a phone? I was like, of course, I've never seen a phone. But he was saying things in Chinese. And then, like, he's like, this thing can take pictures. So he was taking pictures and then showing me on the album, like, do you see this thing can do a lot of things more than like speaking? And then in the pictures, I see my mom's photo. And then I was like, this is mama, mama. It's like my, my mother, my mama. And then that's when he knew the woman that he just saw was my mother. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it, and obviously he raped my mom too. And then he wanted Mina. So he said, if I become his mistress, he was going to buy my mom back from the farmer that he just sold. 
and then he was going to help me find my sister and help me get my sick father out of North Korea. So I made a deal with this devil. And with some miracle, he kept his promise. He did bring my mom back to me. And then he brought my sick father to me, to China. Do you think he fell in love with you? Yeah, I think he did. I think he did, yeah. Let's backtrack for just a second. So when you get trafficked, or when you get sold to the, the Chinese mm -hmm. farmer or the next trafficker, yeah, trafficker, how many, what does that setting look like? <laughs> it's a, uh, from the, when we get to the Chinese side of the riverbank, this guy brought the blankets and then asking me to take off your clothes because I'm gonna like have sex with you. And like I've never knew what the word is sex. And this is a like, dark in the river bank, and there might be guards going around. And this guy is like animals, right? And my mom was like, What are you talking about? She just had a surgery. Like, and I was like, No, I have to have her. Like, then it's like, then take me. So that's when she got raped. And then there was a car was waiting on the, this is a river bank and the up is a road somewhere. So he, I think, called somebody and then some car came. So we went up that river bank up and we got into this a car truck. So, and then in truck, I was, I was not, I never been in a car, had a seat car like that. I have been in a car a few times that was a, where like there's no roof, where like all the, the core like coming out, you know, not like modern car. So I was having this massive car sick. But my mother would ask me to look at North Korea because North Korea is completely dark. And I could see the apartment that my father was in that night. And she told me, look at, look at it. It, it might be the last time you see your hometown again. And it was the, my last time seeing my homeland again. And then that car would take to the apartment that he was in. And then we go inside his apartment. I remember a floor. But in North Korea, it's all cement floor that broken. But his home actually had a wooden floor. I've never seen that in my life like that. Like it's a wooden floor and had electricity. It's at nighttime, his home had electricity. And then there was a lady in the bed and she was telling us that in China, we had to be sold as like slaves. And if you don't want, you can go back to North Korea. But like, how do we go back to North Korea? I mean, even the guard don't catch us. That means we're still dying from starvation. There's no way going back, mm -hmm. right? We still have to stay in China. Then they called somebody and the second trafficker came with his mistress. And she was another North Korean woman like me. So she was came like me, but that man kept her to become his mistress. And then uh, that was a guy who was checking our bodies and to negotiating the price with this guy, you know, how much he would be willing to give for my mom and myself. And then from that house, uh, we cannot stay in the border town long because the authorities keep going by uh, around it was a lot of snow. It was uh, March 26th. No, March 30th. That's the my, day my sister, sister escaped, March 26th. And March 30th, uh, we are escaping. And uh, that day, it was a lot of snow. And then five, around 5 a.m., he wanted to take us to, the second broker wanted to take us his car. So he was asking us to come down from the building and meet him in the car. And then when we go down from the stairs, this traffer, trafficker would stop my mom in the hallway. And he took her pants off and he just raping her there. Oh, okay. man. And, and I think I was like mixed up. I think somehow I blocked that up. And later my mom, when I was writing my first book, she was saying that was like two separate events. And that's actually when I really saw it. Because in the riverbank, I couldn't see much, and I just heard it. And that's when my mom was asking me to turn around and cover my ears. And, 
and then from after that rape, the we they would cross in the car again, another car, and there, uh, another lady joined. Three of us in the back, and then the car was going all the way to Changchun, like inside China. So oh, yeah. it's a lot of hiding in car and just moving as fast as you can because of we can get caught. Man, that is. How are you dealing with all this now? Oh, well, I feel like <laughs> I had many different lives. You know, at this point, it's like lived through a lot of lives, but I think I'm just grateful. You know, none of that killed me, and I was able to see the world that was a lot more than this. So I think because I've I saw it, I can be a lot be more grateful now. That I can be a lot happier with the little things these days. Yeah. So it's in, in some ways, it's, I guess it's a blessing. <laughs> I mean, how I look at it is a blessing. At least for me, that's how I decided to look at it. Let's go back to when you became this trafficker's mistress. Mm -hmm. The guy who, how were you treated at that point? Um. Uh, a lot of beating because I was fighting to be, even after initial rape, it was very painful. It was really painful. And I thought my body was getting split out of it. And then I felt this shame. I felt so dirty. I was like, like, you know, rub myself till I was with the bleep. Like, constantly in the shower afterwards, it was so shameful. So he, he would have beat me to get out of that. And I was constantly like, how can I just die? You know, how can I end this? But the only thing was he was saying, I'm going to bring your mom. But like, bring my mom was not going to happen one day. Even after the first rape, he had to go back and negotiate the price with my mom because he sold my mom. And this farmer's not gonna sell my mom for the same price. They were gonna try to make more money out of it. Mm -hmm. So they had to negotiate the price and it took several months. And I think during that time it was very hard because, and then during that time he had to go buy other girls to sell them. So during that time he would lock me in the apartment. And I cannot go outside. So the door is locked from the outside, many doors. And even the windows has a gates in. And I was in an apartment for, I don't know, 15 days by myself. Like, I don't even know how many days because there's no clock. And only thing I see is like sun rises and goes down. But I cannot even turn the lights on because other people can see and police can come in. So I... I don't know how many days I was in the apartment so alone. A lot of times he would lock the door and go and come back. But he would buy me some food and he'd go. And, and sometimes the travel gets delayed. Then he did not buy enough food for me to eat. So uh, I always have to, some days. I think he, he only thought he was going to be gone for like a, a week. But that time he was gone for many, many days because he had to sell this girl to Sandong. is a different, different um, state. And Sandong is a very poor town. So a lot of farmers cannot find wives. They buy North Korean girls. So he had to take this girl. It takes almost like several days to get there. And then negotiating the price, looking for the man. And it takes many days. So I ate the food quickly because I thought it was going to be seven days. And I had to be hungry many, many days afterwards. So afterwards, I was always like still be very conservative how I split the food until it comes. Wow. And <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I completely forgot a lot, a lot about this. <laughs> but eventually my mom came and I think that was like hope for me. Like I listened to got one person out of it and I had my father to save and my sister was safe so after my mom came that was much better I think how was that when you're well describe that 
that exact moment when you see my mom were reunited with your mother? Oh, um, we I saw in a cornfield. By then, it was I was reunited with her by like uh, April first, right? This is now in almost the harvest time, or mid like, hot hot summer day. They. I met her in the middle of the cornfield because uh, we couldn't see the authority and she was sold to this farmer, so I had to go there. And she saw away from, she saw me far away, but she did not think that was me because I became a different person. She thought like I just became an adult. So until it came close, she didn't say my name. She just thought like she saw a strange woman standing there. And she saw me like a few meters. And then she just spoke in tears. And the first thing she did was give me a pee back. Because until that moment, I was her baby. So she was like, how much my baby has grown? And she was giving me a pee back. I was like, I'm not a baby anymore. I've been raped. You know, I'm not a kid. And. I felt so awkward that she was treating me like a kid out of nowhere. And for her, like, only a few months ago, I was a little kid in North Korea, sitting her on that. And in North Korea, we don't have separate rooms. I was always sleeping next to her at nighttime. And she was just, she couldn't believe it, how much changed in a few months of time for both of us. Wow. And... I think from that point, I became her husband because <laughs> I was speaking Chinese and she didn't. So she had to rely on literally everything on me because she could not even say, I want water, <laughs> I want to go to the bathroom. So I had to translate everything for her. And till this day, I'm like almost like her husband that she lost. It's a, our dynamic forever changed from that point on. How did the, uh, what was the, what was the man's name who purchased you, the trafficker? It's Hong Mei. How did he treat your mother when he, when he purchased her again? <sighs> I think it was awkward because he raped her a lot. And, um, it, I mean, how do you deal with that? Yeah. But did he, he did he allow you and your mother to communicate on a regular basis? Were you guys together a lot, or did he have keep you separated? I mean, the t days he wanted to rape me, he would take me away, and he was just sleeping with all these girls that he was buying. So it was like, in a way, I was lucky he didn't need me every day, you know. And he was going on these trips for months that he had to go sell these girls, but. That's when he also raped all these girls, like every one of them. Like literally, that's a ceremony. You know, whenever you get a new girl, that's what they you you rape these girls, and you on the other broker buys you. That's the day you get raped. Like every single person buys you. That's when you get raped many many times, and they just rape in the car. They rape you on the street, even in the farmland. They take you in the cornfield and they rape you there. It's, I never knew it was that many ways you could rape somebody. Like, there's no dignity, there's no, like, privacy. It's like, if they, at least I was this Lobans, like, he's called Lobans, a boss's wife. But these girls who come and there's no dignity. If these guys want to rape you, they just rape you in front of everybody. Like, there's nothing they do to protect you in any way. And so at least he becoming more respectful towards me. Initially he was hitting me and he was treating me like all other girls that he's been treating. And somehow by some miracle, he was falling more in love with me every day. And he was looking for ways to divorce his Chinese wife who he had two children with. His just daughter was one year younger than me and he wanted to actually marry me and want to have a child with me. So 
he became more protective of me in that way. So he became more uh, becoming nice to my mother. But then after one year passes, he becoming addicted to gambling. And, and then he, when he brought my father, that's when my father was very sick. And by then he had enough of me, right? Like, so the beating starts again and threatening starts again. And my father passes away and one less burden for him. And then he would not even give enough money to buy any food for my mom anymore. Like in China, I couldn't buy her like water because in the apartment, if you don't pay the like money, the water stops. So before the water cut off, I learned the way to turn the tap just a little bit. So one tap, tap, tap drops the entire night and we get the one bucket of water for that week. And the meter stops before we stop because he stopped paying for the money. And eventually I had to sell my mom because I couldn't find her any, any food in China. So I sold her to another farmer and then with that money he spent just one evening for gambling, he spent all that money. And I had to run away from him because he was, couldn't feed me. And then I got kidnapped by another gangster. And this gangster was a lot darker than Hongwei. He, this gangster actually kills people. He, that's his job, like killing people. And, uh, I eventually got, like, ran away from him, too. Let's go back for just a minute. Mm -hmm. Your dad passed away. Mm -hmm. It's 2008, he passed away in February. Let's he, talk about that. He, How did he pass? He got to China on my birthday, October 10th of 2007. And then he was already very, very sick because he was tortured so much in the prison camp. He had a colon cancer because he was eating rocks. I mean, he was eating soap. I mean, he was eating the things that human beings should never eat. And that was the only way he could survive. So he, uh, he passed away a few months later in China. So... Did you get to have a funeral? No, I think happen? the way I keep trying to push this thing is that because even though he's my hero to this day, but it was so hard to take care of him in China that we were in some sense waiting for him to die because he was becoming, becoming more delirious as the time goes by and the pain is so much. And he sometimes forgets that even in China and he wants to keep going to back North Korea. He wants to keep... I'm going to be buried in North Korea next to my father and my homeland. And I couldn't do that for him. I could not take him to North Korea. I mean, there's no way I, I could do that. And then uh, Hong Mei was very frustrated because my father, he thought if we bring him, he could make my father as a forced labor and make money out of him. But he was too sick to do any work. So uh, he was he was tired feeding him and taking care of him. So a lot of just beating on me, just getting it out of me. He was frustrated with him, so he would take it out on yeah. you. Yeah, so I couldn't mourn his death. I couldn't even feel anything for him. I was just, I was barely surviving. So he, when he passed away, doctor said he was going to leave. Six months, I'm like, how am I going to take care of him for six months? You know, I cannot even do one day at a day. And he passed away just four months afterwards. And in some sense, I heard when I was not there, my mom had to give him a lot of pills to accelerate the process. And my mom, my dad somehow didn't want to die. Unlike me, he did not want to die. He thought life was a gift that you have to keep fighting for it. And I could understand, like, how do you fight for life when your life is, means this little, you know? 
time was so much easier that time. So I couldn't get it, but somehow he still thought life was a gift. And he passed away and buried the ashes in the middle of the night when everybody was sleeping. And that was the end of his life. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> it's you okay. Had to, you had to hide the, the, the funeral, the, the ceremony. Yeah, there's no no such a thing. It's a we are fugitives. We cannot we cannot even cry because we cannot other people see us hearing us. So we had to be as discreet as possible. So moving forward, mm -hmm. you're with the new trafficker who murders people. Yeah. What happened there? A lot of beating, and. A lot of threatening. He had like nine harems with him. And nine what? Nine girl harems. Okay. They were Chinese actually. And this guy was so, it was in the 50s or 60s guy. I'm like 14 years old. He somehow has so much money, and that's why he was having this nine Chinese mistresses, right? That means he's really worthy. I mean, most of Chinese guys can't even find one girl for them. He got nine of them, or these teenage girls. And these girls were so happy to be with him, even. Uh, he, somehow, none of them could give him a son. And he took me to this fortune teller who was blind old man in a man, like some elderly home. He took me there. And then, like, do you see a future, like a son in her future? And he says, yes. I said, apparently I have my son now in America, but maybe that's the son he saw, right? <laughs> Life is so crazy. So he sees my son in his future. It's like, yeah, I totally see a very healthy young boy in her life. And he says, you should definitely keep her. She's gonna give you a son. And then this guy becomes so obsessed. He demands that I give him a son. And it's, it's scary. It's, it, it, every day he says, you, you are less valuable than a pig. You know, I can kill you in this spot and nobody gonna do anything to me. So you better do whatever I say, tell you. And I was isolated from my mom again. She was now with a farmer that I sold her to. I want to see my mom, and he would not let me. So at the time, Hong Wei was fighting to get me back. And then Hong Wei was said, I'm going to give my life for this. Like, are you willing to die for Yan Mi? And he's like, no, why are you talking about why would you die for a girl? You know, they are so, you can just buy them. They are so replaceable. And this gangster eventually realized I'm just not it's just not worth of me to fight this much to keep her. So he's he somehow and then I told him, if you just let me go see my mom, I'm gonna come back to you. Like just let me go see my mom once. And he got convinced. So he had enough trust with me at the time that I was faking it. Like just trust me, I'm gonna see come back to just see my mom and come back to you. Why would I not want to be with you? You're this powerful man. Like, every woman want to be with you, you know? And he said, okay, that logically makes sense because all these girls want to give a child to him because he was going to buy them the most expensive apartment and life secured for them. So when he let me go, I took that bus and go see my mom. I threw that phone away because I knew that he planted, you know, he was working with the police to track all these girls. The police is corrupt. So I threw the phone and I ran away with my mom. And I found the home way back. And then there we found a lady told us that there's a way we can get a shelter, which means we had to join a sex chat room. Where is, it's not actual prostitution, no man comes there to rape you. But you are in front of a cam and computer, and you show your body. But if you do that, then they're going to give you a place to sleep and eat. And we, I was begging to go like washing dishes in the restaurants during that time. I was like, just let me work. Like I can 
wash dishes. I can't do anything. Just give me a job. Like, I don't even need to get paid. Just give us some place to sleep and eat. And they wouldn't give us any of that job in China. So only place we can go for is another. This kind of dark world. Wow. And that's how we joined the chat room. Damn. <laughs> how did you... How did you get out of that? Uh, in this chat room, the clients were South Koreans. Because South Koreans were wealthier than Chinese. So they would, for them to spend like $5 membership to see a live person performing any sex, sex acts they want is much more thrilling than watching it just boring porn. So a lot of South Korean men would just pay money to come and chat with these girls and ask them to show their body. And, and because the economic power is very different. So for them, this was not a lot of money for them. And then in this chat room, we met another North Korean woman. And she somehow got in touch with some missionaries from South Korea who were rescuing North Koreans. And she said she was too afraid to go herself because the chance of making was 1%. Because oh, the man. path was walking across Gobi Desert into Mongolia. And most of people die there. You don't make it. So she was just too afraid to make that decision by herself. So she was asking, would you come with us? Because it was my mom and myself and her three of us now. Because it's better than going alone. And we spoke with our missionaries over the phone. And that was for the first time. Somebody felt bad for us. We told them about like how we lost our sister. And they said, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm going to pray for her. And we thought maybe we can trust these people. Like, you know, like there was never, nobody ever prayed for us. Nobody ever said like, I'm so sorry you're going through this. And this missionary who never met us, who doesn't even know, know our name, said, I'm so sorry that you're going through it. And if you believe in God, he will take care of it. And you can come out of this. So we decided to join the missionaries from there. Did you know what God was? No, I did not know. I did not. I actually, I, was, I just laughed. Because as a North Korean who believed that having no problem that Kim Il-sung was my God, it was just bizarre to me that they were believing exact same thing that I believed, just the names were different. You know, just they switched the Kim Il-sung to God and Kim Jong-il to Jesus. Literally, same com Ten Commandments there. Like, I just thought it's another weird world that I was in. The only difference was that these people were not rapists, were not trying to make money out of us. They were just doing it to glorify their God. They thought that God wanted to North Korean people to know who he was. And that's what they were giving their life to. So I thought, what these weird people, you know? You believe something you don't see and come to this dangerous land and rescuing people like us for in the name of God. And, and then at the time, it's honestly, it didn't matter if they asked me to believe in a rock, I would have believed it because I was that desperate, mm -hmm. you know? It, was, it wasn't even me trying to pretend. When you're desperate, you can believe in the air. You can believe in a hair. Like, if somebody tells you, if you believe in this thing, you're going to be safe, you're going to believe that as, as hard as you can. So I became a believer. That my mom became a believer, and we studied the Bible for several months there. Immediately. Yeah, the first day they asked us to repeat and the prayer that to be saved by Jesus, his his sacrifice and they said now you're Christians that now you are God's people and you are saved and now your life is on him and he's going to take care of you that's interesting that you found faith that quickly especially considering everything that you had been through in North Korea and in China and I lost it in South Korea <laughs> I think in China was just out of desperation yeah it's you know at how, the time, that was the only option for me to be saved. How many 
if you had an estimation, how many times do you think you were raped? Not, not count. Hundreds? I would not rather count. I understand. Definitely a lot. Definitely. It's not something that I can count, but a lot. But I don't know. It's just as a rape victim, you keep sort of saying, I'm not dirty, you know? It's like, I'm not dirty. But you always feel that. You feel like dirty. And I think it's a lot of times North Korea we cannot come out with their stories because of this. Because this prejudice somehow that you are the fourth, that you can never be like somebody else that who's pure and clean and I just even say thinking about it, if my son sees this someday, he's gonna think of me dirty, that makes me afraid. I think he would be very proud of you. Yeah, I hope so. I think he would be extremely proud of his mom. Yeah. <laughs> for everything that you've been through and what you're doing now. And, and it's, you are a walking miracle. Yeah, I am. <laughs> do you realize that? I do. I'm very lucky. The only reason I asked that question is I mm. wanted to show the severity of what you'd been through and, and, and the miracle on how fast you were able to find some sort of faith in, in a higher power or God. Yeah, it's a... <laughs> It's a lot. You, it's not. They just treat you like a toy. So it's, they, you do go through a lot. And one thing I am grateful is that I was bought by the boss. So I didn't get thrown around like most of people do. Yeah. That you, if you get just bought by even a normal farmer, you, you it's not just one person gonna do that to you. Everybody can do that to you. How did... I mean, it sounds like, so when you went to South Korea, you felt compassion and love and a lot of good emotions that probably you've never felt yeah. ever in your entire life. What, I mean, what did that... How did that feel to you? <sighs> it, 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 being able to express your emotions and... and and I don't know if you felt happiness yet, or I don't know if no, you I felt love yet, but yeah. what did it feel like to, I mean, to have compassion towards you? Did it, did it, I mean, you'd never experienced any compassion towards you whatsoever up yeah. until this point. Mm -hmm. I think I only felt that in America. You didn't feel it in South Korea? No, because South Korea was very not forgiving country. I could not talk about my human trafficking experience there because no sane man would marry me and who would have a child with me. And no normal mother in law is gonna accept me as their, you know, South Korea is very traditional conservative society. And my dream was always being a mother. I always as a child I don't know, I always want to be a mother. And I I couldn't in South Korea there's no chance of me ever being married to some normal, respectable man if I had a past. So I couldn't talk about that. And also life in South Korea wasn't that easy because when we get there, they say like we are a very competitive country and North Koreans don't have a skill set. We don't speak English. We don't know what computer is. Like we don't know. We don't have any education. Mm -hmm. And we cannot even work as the waitress because our accent is from north so they don't even give you a job at the bakery you cannot even serve dishes at the restaurant it's hard to find a job like in my north korean girlfriends they come to america they find job easily they work in the elder care they work in the nail salon they don't care you speak the broken english as long as you want to work hard they give you a job not in south korea they, they don't rape you because police are going to come after you, but because we have accent and we are, as you can see, a lot smaller than them. And so they don't give us jobs easily. And it's very hard to find any job there. 
Who was teaching religion then? Mm -hmm. The Bible. In South Korea, they a lot of them are Christians, but the country are not like America is multicultural. They are not used to outsiders, and the only people they respect are the wealthy white people. You know, it's like French Americans who are come, then they are fine. But if you come from Vietnam, uh, Laos, or North Korea, good countries are poorer than them. They definitely discriminate. Okay. So it's a definitely based on economic power they do. Well, when you got there, so the missionaries saved you mm. from South Korea. So what, what, where did they put you when you got to South Korea? No, so they don't put us in it. So missionaries would put us in the shelter in uh, Qingdao region in China. And then after we studied Bible for several months, then they send us to walk across the desert. Okay. Okay. So we cross the desert ourselves. They don't come with us. It's too dangerous. The chance of making it so low. So they would say, gave us a compass. Like you go and cross like eight wire thin fences. You might reach China. I mean North uh, Mongolia. Then if you get discovered by a Mongolian guards, tell them that you are North Korean and want to go to South Korea. Okay. But chance of you get discovered by Mongo Chinese soldiers is very high. There are wire fences, electrified fences, and wild animals, and it's minus 40 degrees cold. It's most of them don't make it. That's why they don't cross the Mongolia path. Usually they all go through Thai Thailand. How did you make it across? Walking. We walked. How long? Uh, just one day, because it some summer months they walk even months or days, but usually we pick the most coldest time. So guards wouldn't think that somebody would be this crazy enough to cross the border right now. Oh my God. So it was like minus 40 degrees and like even your breathe becomes ice cream, so cold. So you wait for the worst weather conditions. Because that's at least high security. Otherwise, if it's the summertime, just boards hanging out everywhere, they're gonna shoot you. They're not gonna let you cross the border. So we chose a time and we crossed the, that uh, distance was the shortest distance between the Gobi Desert. Wow. Well, let's take a let's take another short break, and then when mm -hmm. we come back, we'll talk about your journey to the United States. Great. Perfect. You've probably heard me talk about my psychedelic journey last year and all the benefits that came from doing it. One being that I haven't drank in almost a year. I have not had any caffeine in almost a year. My anxiety is gone. My anger is gone. A whole list of benefits came from that, and it led me down this journey of researching benefits of mushrooms and fungi in general. In my research, I found this company called Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and herbs with a fraction of the caffeine as a cup of coffee. I have energy without anxiety, jitters, or the crash of coffee. What I really like about Mudwater is that they took the time to find the perfect ingredients to make a product to help you feel better every day. I genuinely believe that Mudwater is a good product. It's Whole30 approved, 100% USD organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Mudwater also donates monthly to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics as Mudwater believes the country is a mental health epidemic, and so do I. Go to mudwater.com slash Sean to support the show. Use the code Sean for 15% off. That's mudwater.com slash Sean. Use code Sean for 15% off. Looking to get your financial future organized? or more importantly, your kids' and family's financial future organized? Well, if you don't have life insurance yet, you might want to put that at the top of your list. Fabric by Gerber Life is the easy, one-stop shop you need with life insurance and other family finance solutions all in one place. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes. With over 1,600 five-star reviews on Trustpilot.com, you can feel confident that you're getting a high-quality policy that is perfect for your family. You could be offered coverage instantly with no health exam required. 
Protect your family today with Fabric by Gerber Life. Apply in just 10 minutes at meetfabric.com slash Sean. That's meetfabric.com slash Sean. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash Sean. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. All right, we're back from the break. You have seen probably more trauma than anybody that sat in that chair. And I don't know how much you know about this show, but it's a lot of combat veterans and a lot of special operations guys. And we talk about, we talk a lot about healing after the traumas of war. Mm. I've not heard anything that comes close to what you've experienced. So before we get into um, coming to the United States, how, how I'm curious, because I don't want to run out of mm-hmm. time on this portion. How are you, how are you processing all this? How are you, are you going to therapy? Have you looked at psychedelics? Mm. Have you looked at, I mean, how, how do you get through it all? I think mental strength is a, it can be exercised. So I think even like just not talking about it was very hard because I know I'm traumatized, right? Because like it's irrational that I'm gonna worry about my son is going to not think of me as a good person. But I think my strength is always coming from, I'm in a position can talk about this, but there are people actually living through what I went through. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you a lot worse. And I think that knowledge gives me strength to keep speaking up. So you're finding your strength for speaking for the oppressed. Yeah, for those speakers, I know what it feels to go through that terror. Like, I'm in a place that people are so good, they talk about trauma, you mm-hmm. know? Like in North Korea, we don't even have that as a concept. And I'm in a place there's therapy, but actual people who go through this darkness, they don't even know what that is. They just, every day is a torture and terror. So yeah, if I can't even talk about it, I mean, what can I do in the world? And I also believe, like you said, I'm lucky that there is a reason why I got saved. There is only 209 defectors made it to America over the last 80 years. There's only 209 yeah. in the past, did 80 you say years. 80 yeah. years? Mm-hmm. So, of course I'm lucky. Despite everything I've gone through, I'm the luckiest person that I know of. So, I think keeping that perspective is very important. And I don't go to therapy, I don't do any drugs, I am not on any anxiety pills. I never took one. I have done one, like, psychedelic therapy, but I you just... Did. Once, but what was it? I think it was. Let's put it that way. It was helpful, but I don't think I thought I needed one again. It wasn't a something that I had to do it again. To me, it was. It's more important for me to make a decision on why I survived. Like. I survived to tell this story. I survived that to sh- shine the light in the darkness. And it's bigger than me, right? My story is a lot bigger than me. Like there are 300,000 of North Korean girls. Mm-hmm. Their organs are harvested out of them. I didn't get that. I'm so, so lucky. So I do sometimes worry though, like American culture is Sometimes overly com- like compassionate, they almost expect you to become a victim. They almost expect you to not to function very well. A lot of people keep asking me, like, how are you so high functional? <laughs> how are you so positive? Like, why are you so normal? And there's kind of some expectation that if you've gone through a certain trauma, you're almost like obligated to feel not as good. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird. Like even being a mother, the most honorable, beautiful thing that I've ever done, 
doctors keep asking, you know, the, like the postpartum depression is a normal thing. Do you feel depressed? Every doctor's visit there keep asking you, are you depressed? I'm like, you are making me depressed now by asking that, right? So I try not to get into this cultural mindset where become less resilient, that I know that we are a lot stronger than we are. And I try not let to become less strong. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not in a survivor mode in any way, but strength is a good thing. Resilience is a great thing if you can keep that. So I just decided that I can manage. I mean, if I survive that in real life, of course I can survive as a memory of it. Wow. I, I was not expecting you to say that. And I think that it is amazing that you're saying you refuse to victimize yourself after everything you've been through. And I think that that is a enormous problem that we're facing in the United States with people victimizing themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to listen to somebody like you with your story who's not victimizing themselves and to watch the people in the United States who have all these opportunities, you know, to, to, to improve whatever portion of their life they think needs to be improved. And they just, they, they, they victimize themselves. It's, yeah. it's, it's the common theme now and it's becoming more and more common. Yeah. It's really sad it's to see that people are, I mean, it's even today I was driving here, like, even trees are shining right here, and the roads, I mean, every the house, the peace, and this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And if you cannot have a pride to be a member of this country, I mean, what can you ever be proud of in the world? Like, we built this country, we have this country, and it's a miracle. Yeah. Of course, it has problems to fix, but every, everything is. But losing that perspective and losing that gratitude I think that's very hard. And if you lose gratitude, you're never going to be ever happy. You know, when you're only grateful, you can be happy. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's talk about your, your journey to the United States mm -hmm. and how that happened. Where did that start? So 2014, I was a junior year in university in South Korea studying criminal justice. And I had the opportunity to speak at a conference in Dublin, Ireland. And that was my really first public speech. And I don't know if you've ever seen me in the handbook with a Korean traditional pink dress and giving a speech. Th that was an amazing speech. <laughs> that was my very, really first speech. And that was the first speech you ever gave? Yeah. Wow. And very I was, impressive. I was just turned 21 on that, that like a few days before that podium. And I had no idea I was going to come to America because I don't have money. I don't have connections. I cannot buy the plane. I mean, I don't have visa money to come here. Uh, but I did visit America in 2013 as a mission group in Tyler, Texas, to study Bible and do an outreach program for a disciplinary program. I came here 12 weeks and went back to Korea and studied in the university again. But uh, this time, after my speech, I had a book offer from Penguin Random House to write my first book. And then my agent was in New York City. So I went to meet my agent in New York, and then they said, let's write a book. But while I was writing the book, I wanted to continue my university education because I didn't finish it. And they said, oh, there is a great school in New York, which called Columbia University. <laughs> <laughs> so just like that though great I mean I I I love learning it's, it's what I live for like understanding how the world works and how the human history formed it's just most fascinating thing right so I applied to Columbia and I got in so how that's how I moved to America in 2015 to publish my first book and starting at Columbia University in 2016 January so I came here eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what is the first thing, I mean, what is the first thing that you noticed when, when you settled in here? To New York City? Mm-hmm. I mean, <sighs> that's, that's a lot, that is a lot of freedom to take in 
at once? Yeah, I think it was a lot. I mean, I, I first place I got to was Times Square because they from DC they with cheapest ticket they could get in Chinese bus they they booked me and they sent me in a bus from DC to New York and it gets off some airport authority near Times Square thing. And then uh, I got in taxi and got out was like Times Square. And I, I literally first thing I remember was it was brighter than daytime. It's nighttime. And then in North Korea as a child, you always remember because the North Korean propaganda television says, we are going to make America a sea of lights by bombing them with a nuclear weapon. I was like, yeah, they don't need our help. <laughs> it's already sea of lights here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's literally brighter than daytime. And then, you know, it's what made me all of New York City was if you give freedom to individuals, like what they are capable of building with it, what is the potential of humanity was just for scary in New York City that looking at this empire state building, you know, Rockefeller Center, like, all these buildings would compete with each other and try to leave a mark in the world. And I think that one thing my, ma my father told me as a young girl was, when tigers die, they leave their skin. But when people die, they leave their names. That's why he told me to make my name long and lasting. And in America, you can do that. Not only dictator can do that. In North Korea, everything is about dictator. Every statue, we don't have ads. Because you cannot compete with a dictator. We don't have advertisement. But in America, I mean, these people trying to make their name lasting and building them buildings out of their name, libraries, the symphony halls, everything. And I was just amazed that this is a land of individuals, that the individual matters in this land, and they celebrate being an individual. And you are no longer about this collective thing. You get judged for who you are, what you are, what you are trying to do. And I just felt that was so empowering. Because, you know, you cannot choose your ancestor. I mean, can you choose your ancestor? No. You cannot choose your birthplace. I think that was the greatest, op I mean, injustice I've ever seen, that people get punished for something they didn't choose. That is why racism is wrong. That's why punishing people for their birthplace is wrong, right? But in America... They only judge you for who you are right now. And that was America that I thought I was getting into, for sure. And initially, that's what my impression was. Yeah. That's a... Um, man, that's got to be a lot to... I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around all the oppression, you know. How old were you when you got to the U.S.? 21. 21 years mm -hmm. of oppression. Yeah. And then you get here, and literally any door you want to walk through is open. Yeah, it was. And I mean, there's so many funny things. Like in, I heard like New York City people are busy and I go to Central Park, everybody just keep running. And I thought like they are running for work, but they were trying to burn off their calories. So in North Korea, we had to conserve our energies to survive. We don't know what gym is. We don't know what exercise is. Every day is a hard labor. And you come to America, their problem is burning off calories. They pay money to burn off their calories, right? My girlfriends would go to like Equinox gym mm -hmm. and they have membership. They go to group classes to burn like, oh, showing off, I burn like 500 calories today. I'm like, you pay money for that? <laughs> 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 like, it's just, it's crazy to me. Like, why would you pay money off to kill your own calorie, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. And like my girlfriends would show me their like dating apps, you know, their Tinder like left the right thing. And there's any guy you want to date, any even woman that you want to date, there's nothing about your class, your songbun or caste, anybody you, it's a f total freedom. Like who you marry, who you want to be with is free. And I mean, literally you get any food at nighttime in Uber Eats, right? It's just Every food is available anywhere. And in North Korea, I've never seen a cookbook. Because how can we afford, you know, five kilograms of, like, pork and garlic, like, butter? We don't have those ingredients. There's no cookbook. There's no recipe. We just find whatever we can gather that day. 
and I never heard like cook was a job. And I mean, there were so many jobs that I never knew. There were people like wedding planners. Like in North Korea, there's nobody plans your wedding, you know? Yeah. It's like party approval, that's it. And so many jobs, different jobs. And of course, understanding hedge fund for the first time. <laughs> it was just completely new, new planet. Man, it's, um, so what's your favorite food? Steak. What was your favorite food coming to the U.S.? Steak. Steak? Because, I mean, it's a, it's a, in North Korea, I think I had a thing, because the cows had more rights than us. So coming to America, eating beef and not getting executed, it was like giving a middle finger to Kim Jong-un every day, you know? Wow. <laughs> it was like, I'm like determined to eat as much steak as I can. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> what about, so the dating scene, that's something that I didn't, I didn't even... I never even thought about it until you just brought it up. So, I mean, in North Korea, you're not allowed to date. You're not allowed. You're, you're not allowed to think. Yeah. How did you? What? How did you start dating? That was hard. I didn't date anybody in South Korea because they. Maybe this is the trauma comes with it. I never wanted to date Asian men. Mm -hmm. Like I was never attracted to it, and I never kissed Asian men. Like it's a. I think because of all my rape episodes, the Asian men, I was, I guess, maybe associating that with it. Yeah. So, in some sense, coming to be completely honest, I have nothing to against Asian. My son is Asian. People believe me. <laughs> I am not that. But maybe it was easier to come into America. People did not speak any Korean or Chinese. It was they were speaking English. They looked different and. I was able to start that dating at 21 again. And I dated a Russian Jew who escaped from Soviet Union as a child. As a Jew, they were also persecuted. So there was a lot of connection to understand the oppression. Okay. And then, and then it was weird because in New York City, I was at 21 in a very conservative community relationship. And all my friends were like, what are you doing? You're 21. You need to supposed to test the water like you need to have fun you need to you know self-actualize by dating a lot of people see what you like so they were like keep saying i'm doing wrong by being in a committed relationship that is my first relationship so there's a lot of social pressure being in college and telling me that it's not okay to be that serious at 21. Yeah, that's a lot of influence. yeah and everybody literally the people that i really admired they were telling me that you know, you, you are a woman, you need to enjoy your sexuality. And it, it was shocking. Did you find it, did you get enjoyment out of dating and getting to know different men or? I did not date casually ever. So first person I was dating for a year, very seriously. The very first date wound yeah. up being a year long relationship. Yeah. And second man that I met was my husband. Okay. So I don't think I ever got into American dating scene like that. And also it was interesting because uh, <laughs> they're all lovely people, but from North Korea, I thought big, fat, bald men were attractive because mm. we were very starving in North Korea. And in America, like I was just attracted to a lot of people that my, fi my friends did not find attractive. <laughs> So my girlfriends were just so amazed. Like, you have a very odd taste. <laughs> well, when you articulate it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because it, I did not know the conventional American beauty standard. And so I did not know what it was for a very confused long time. And so, yeah, dating was very... Uh, but Americans were not just mental at all. They knew my story. None of them ever judged me for my, what I had to do to survive. I'm very grateful for that. And yeah, I, they made me feel like a woman who's, who's worthy of desire. And I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Let's, let's move into some of the similarities mm -hmm. that you see today, which your book. Yeah is what, you know, the message that you're sending out. What are, what are some of the first similarities? What comes to your, your mind first? What, what are you seeing that resembles maybe the beginning of what happened in North Korea here in the United States? 
There are too many, but let's begin with a few. Uh, one is attacking individuality. It's now America becoming more of attacking that. You know, it's all about collective guilt in America. As I said, my son is half white. They say he's privileged and he's guilty. He did not choose to be white. Nobody in America today alive owns a slave. Nobody ever should feel guilty and nobody is privileged because of their ancestors. America using race to divide people and making each other hate each other. And I think that's very heartbreaking. They are using exact same tactic to divide North Korean people. They are using the same tactic here. Second is meritocracy. In North Korea, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how hard you want to work. It's all about, in America, nice here, equity, right? Are you a person of color? Are you a sexual minority? And the companies have quotas. Universities have quotas. Literally, universities, the place where you try to train you to be competent, mm -hmm. giving you the best skill you can. It's not about that, it's your skin color. They have different skin quotas on Harvard, Columbia. Based on just, based on test scores, more than 70% of people at Harvard should be Asians. But no, they only uh, accepted over 11% of them Asians each year because of skin color. So that's heartbreaking because how we get better as a society, promoting competition and competence. Yeah. We do not, we need to appreciate that people's hard work. When somebody told me about justice in South Korea, I never heard about justice once. I asked them like, what is justice? And this person said to me in South Korea, if you work hard, you're going to get rewarded for that in South Korea, because that is justice. That's why I work so hard. Now in America, hard work becomes, that means less and less because it's all about the diversity of inclusion, <laughs> the yeah. quota, equity, and that destroys civilization. We have tried that. And nobody knows how to build anything. In North Korea, if your father is a king, like Kim Jong-un, he becomes a leader. If your father was a farmer, you become a farmer, right? And you cannot rise. And I don't think discriminating Marriage is a, any good thing. It's a very dangerous path that we are digging into. And people do that. Like, and not only that, like at Colombia, they attack science. They said that math is racist. Mm -hmm. And this is the very first lesson that I learned in North Korean classroom. My teacher asked me one day, what is one plus one? I said two, and she said wrong. Because my dear literally discovered at a young age, adding one drop of water to another drop of water, it becomes bigger one. It doesn't become two. That's how he proved that math was made up by white men. Interesting. Now in America, they say the same thing. The math is made up. Gender is made up. This is a gender is a social construct that was made up by white men to control the minority. And I'm a woman. Like I'm never. I can never be a man. Like, woman is a woman. You have a uterus, you have, like, you make eggs, you have different ge genetics. And now, me saying this, that I argued with my professor one day, I can never be a m man. And she said, you are brainwashed. And if it's a science, you got to debate that. If you cannot question the science in current America right now. Then that's end of progress. If you cannot challenge the science, then there's no progress. And if no progress means you are getting destroyed, that's a very scary path that we're getting into. Yeah. So all these attacks and also about the same thing that I was, my teachers were telling me how the most important thing is my dear leader, not my parents. Now our children at school learning that our parents are not safe because they are bigots. They're never going to understand you, right? They tell you that your parents are not safe space. If they don't accept who you are, legitimize everything that you feel, you gotta run away from them. We try to destroy families, get that tie away, and destroy the state, destroy the institutions that ha does not have your best interest. And seeing those family bonds getting destroyed in America every day. 
and your child is not yours anymore, right? They go to school. They learn that the, all the problems in the world right now we have is because of white men, because of greedy capitalism. And I ask them, like, without capitalism, these kids at Columbia wearing like a few hundred dollars yoga pants on their green juice detox because they are eating too much good food. In their hand MacBook and internet and in that MacBook telling me how horrible capitalism is. I mean, without capitalism, they would not have any of that. They would not be able to sit in the room where there's air conditioning in, there's electricity, there's internet to learn the material. And they learn to hate capitalism. And the professor said that the only solution to all these problems that we have is a communist revolution. What is it like for you to sit there and listen to that shit? I was, I initially thought like, did I go back to North Korean classroom? Because it was identical. How on earth, after all that my journey to be free, I come to sit in the classroom and learn the same thing that I learned in North Korean classroom. How is this possible? And how are we okay with that? Because we know what happens. If we follow those ideologies, we're going to become like North Korea. That ideology drove North Korea, China, I mean, Soviet Union. Every country tried to work with that ideology. It brought death to millions of human beings. Nothing has been more dangerous than this ideology of collectivism and communism equity. And our politicians, I mean, our vice president, our president, talk about how important to fight for equity every day. And equity is evil ideology. This is a complete evil. And if you say that now you're a right wing, like a bigot, I'm a CIA agent. They tell me I am trained by CIA to tell this. I'm like, where is the CIA? Why are they not calling me, right? Like, and they say, oh, you are brainwashed by Fox News. I'm like, I came here in America to not knowing what Fox News is. <laughs> I did not know what conservative or, or like liberal was when I was escaping. I had no agenda. I had no idea what the world was. Just, I come here, I recognize the patterns that I see now and pointing that out now that I'm, I'm the spy. You know, that's how they show you down and kill your character. It's very interesting how many different nationalities or different immigrants are coming here and they're starting to see the writing on the wall. You hear it from Venezuelans, mm -hmm. you hear it from Cubans, you hear it from Chinese. Iranians. You hear it yeah. from Iranians. Yeah. You hear it from North Koreans. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's, do you feel like you're making headway in your mission statement? To by me, bringing yeah. this stuff to light? Do you think people are paying attention? To me, is when I do this work, um, I was very shocked during the pandemic. Um, I thought I brought my son. The best thing I have done too was giving him the American passport, giving him this free country. Unfortunately, pandemic just began as soon as he, became, he becomes a toddler learning how to walk. Pandemic sets in in Chicago. I cannot like afford, I have to t send him to daycare to work. At daycare, he was forced to wear a mask eight hours a day up here. And they let the street clubs open next door. Adults can get, go get drugs and high and do whatever thing they want in the street clubs. Toddler who just barely had to walk at two have to wear a mask up here eight hours a day. There's nothing I could do about that. And then, People saw me, some mothers in the play group, in his play group saw me that I was, I guess, classical liberal, told to their nanny that don't play with my son because of me. And to me, it's not about people are waking up or not. I have no option because this country is not that truly free anymore. During the pandemic, it was not a science. It was a madness. I was, uh, I was robbed on the street in Chicago in front of my son by black women. And they like, broad light. People, this girl was punching me and took my wallet out. And I was trying to call the cop on these thieves. And people surrounding me, looking at me, screaming at me, 
Why are you doing this? You're racist. Why are you doing this? Why are you like, because I was trying to call the cops on these thieves. They are the problem because they can never be oppressed, right? Because of their skin color. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve justice. I don't deserve compassion because of my skin color in America. I mean, this is another side of madness. This is another side of injustice. Because I'm not a black, I don't deserve to be protected by the public. I don't deserve to call the cops and get help from them. And I think this is a thing like people don't understand what the world would be like without America. When I was escaping from North Korea, even that darkness, I had a place to run to. I had hope I can escape to freedom. I mean, if America falls down, where do we escape? No place to go. We don't. This is the last hope for humanity. This is the last hope for me. And this is the only hope for my son. No matter people don't wake up, it doesn't matter, I have to fight. Because I know if we keep going this path of this equity bullshit, we are going to end up like North Korea. And, and already, like, it was so shocking to me, Americans were asking me, are North Koreans are stupid or something? Why don't they just start a revolution? Right? And I'm like, so let me ask you, like, currently now in America, you stand up, it's costing your job, your livelihood, and you, your reputation. But in North Korea, it costs three generations of your children's, your family's life. Your and life, your kid's life, your parents' and your life. Kids life. Yeah. And then in America, even the price is not that much. People are cowards. They go to corporation. They follow the diversity training. They follow all this nonsense. They don't even know what that means. They do as they're told. They do as they're They're following shit. Like it, all these people. If I was alive at the time of the Holocaust, I would have saved Anna Frank. I would be the hero of saving all these people. I'm telling them, yeah, there are 300,000 of North Korean women are going through the modern day Holocaust. What are you doing about it? Nothing. Watching their Netflix. So the hypocrisy of these people. And but you should, I mean, that's the thing. There's no alternative other than keep fighting to me. So I think that's what I'm trying to convey to American people. It's, it's not an option to fight or not. We have to do this. If we don't do this, if we don't protect our freedom, who's going to do it for us? You know, I was always saying, it's important to fight for animals' rights. There are so many of my friends in New York City fight for climate change, fight for little ducks, you know, fight against Canada goose, you know, fighting for dolphins. And to me, they always ask me, like, why are you fighting for human rights? And people ask, like, why do I have to care about human rights? We don't ever ask, why do you have to care about puppies? Right. Somehow, when you fight for human rights, you always have to tell them why you fight for it. Because we are the only ones who can fight for human rights. Dogs will not fight for us. Machines will not fight for us. We are the one, only ones who can fight for our rights as a human beings. Yeah. And somehow, that is not somehow automatically understandable thing to them. That is somehow it's a, a luxury that we should do. You know, We can only afford it when we can. I think what you're saying is a mass population of people who have had it very easy for a very long time. Yeah. They don't understand. They don't. It's like similar but completely different. It's similar to the mindset in North Korea. They can't imagine yeah. what freedom is like. They have no, they have no idea. Mm -hmm what they're missing out on, yeah. you know, in life. And then, you know, turn the tables and come to America and they, Americans, most of them cannot fathom what a life in North Korea would be like or what a life in Venezuela or Cuba or Russia yeah. or Iran, yeah. you know, they cannot, it doesn't, it doesn't even compute, yeah. you know, because if it did, then we wouldn't be seeing the shit that we're seeing right now, you know? Yeah. And I don't know. The divide has become so strong that I don't know. I don't know how to, 
I don't know how to bring this stuff to light. You know, it's people like you that have to bring it to light. And and I think the hardest part of what you have to do is you have to bring the story to two different to two different sides of this country. Yeah. You have to bring it to the right to the conservative side, you have mm-hmm. to bring it to the liberal side and in, in hope to God yeah. that people are listening. Do you do you feel like people are listening? I it's interesting. When I was with my first book, um, I had a media training by uh, the publisher and they gave me training uh, not to talk about anything. Like you remember, I came to America first time and somebody asked me like, what do you think about gun, owning a gun? I said, that is the most empowering thing I've ever heard. Imagine if North Korean people had the guns. They're not gonna let them come execute your mom or your children. They're gonna shoot them back. Even if I mean, it doesn't matter. You're gonna get killed anyway. If we had the guns, governments what? Are they gonna kill all of us? Then who they're gonna rule over? Right? It makes no sense for them to kill all of their people. So there's no country ever can do that to their citizens if the citizens have a right to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. It was about that. I was like, of course we should defend that right. Is it's the most important right I can ever see as a free individual. Keep that liberty. And they were like, okay, what do you like to read? It's like, I like to read John Stewart, like Mears, like on liberty and Basti as the law. And they were like, okay, but just don't talk about that in public. <laughs> because before even you start your fight for Northern people, they're going to brand you as a conservative right-wing uh, conspiracy theorist. Mm-hmm. So I had to avoid that for a long time. I did not talk about that. I only talked about it when the day, when I was seeing the pandemic, how I was powerless raising my son in Chicago. There's nothing I do to make no sense this mask mandate on my kid. There's nothing I could do. You know, they were forcing him to do it. I mean, what can I do? There's nothing I could do. Even though children are safe and they would open the dog parks and then my son, the children's playground is closed in the hot summer day in Chicago, where the sun hits the playground, it sanitizes it all. And I was like, dogs have more rights than my child right now. Dogs can go dog parks and play and run around. My child, because he's a human child, he cannot go to the playground and play together. And I would feel so powerless at the time. And I was like, I'm not gonna repeat the history. I'm not gonna be like my grandmother going to be compl- you know, complying, complying with this, this control. And when it comes to me, I did not know even that I was oppressed. And I'm going to fight everything I have. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> I love hearing that. <clears throat> well, you know me, I think that is a perfect way to end this. And mm-hmm. um, I just want to say I, I know how... I know how hard it can be to share your story. Mm -hmm. I've not experienced anything even close to that, but um, I do know a little something about internal trauma. And I just, I just want to thank you for, for being that vulnerable and, and, and sharing your experiences with my audience. And, and I know it's going to have a tremendous impact and Mm -hmm. uh, I just thank you. And for everybody listening, (laughs) Go by while time remains. Links in the description. And um, and I, seriously, it's been a real honor, you know, hearing your story and getting to know you. And, and, and thank you. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.